question for you then um, that relates to something you told me years ago and something you mentioned in uh, part one. So, so in part one, I'd said to you, was there anything that you had sort of struggled with? And you, you'd said that over time, you found, you know, compared to being a young eagle guy versus vice wing or the even the squadron commander at Schusterberg, you weren't as aggressive in your later years. You may, you said maybe I wasn't as aggressive. That's what you said in, in the last one. Yes. And I remember you told me the story and, and it sort of has stuck with me for, well, since then, I don't know when you told me, it must have been sort of 10, 15 years ago about, you. I don't know if it was at Schusterberg, but you said you landed after a BFM sortie and one of the guys in the flight came up to you and you said he was ashen. He, he had, the color had drained from his face. Um, and he said to you, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and he had scared himself, or maybe he had scared himself for the hundredth time or whatever. And I think you said he ended up going to E3s. You know, he, he, he had a, you know, a happy, a happy end to his career, you know, in, in, in the, uh, in the AWACS. But I wanted to ask you about that then. Um, you know, there's a training bubble, which is the idea is you don't get too close to each other. It's, you know, what is it? A thousand feet, something like that. How does aggression, how do you temper aggression with, you know, not hitting the other guy? How, how, you know, did you scare yourself? How do you deal with the psychology um, and maybe the emotions that hit you afterwards? Um, can you describe what hey. that arena is really like? The um, I think uh, each of us as individuals have our own threshold of when when we get scared and uh, and and when we are completely oblivious to the risk we just took and escape with our lives. Uh, the things that are scary about air to air fighting are the close passes. Uh, so and and some of those are observed; they're intentional. Uh, some of them, though, are completely what you can call blindsided. For a, Another airplane enters the fight. You, you, your essay did not include that 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 airplane in uh, in your calibrations, uh, and you get suddenly surprised, and and maybe you know, and maybe even the the, the passing of the jet wash slams your airplane. Like, you know, holy shit, that was close. Uh, and I've had some of those, um, and, and usually we would sort them out in the debrief. How did that happen? You know, the thousand foot bubble, um, for safety reasons, uh, is is violated in like 1.2 seconds um, if if you're opposing each other. So so it's it's really you know it it doesn't really exist um, uh, as a helpful aid. I mean, um, uh, it, on face to face combat. In other words, in the, in the front quarter. The place where it's it's very good is getting a person, and now we're going to the subject of tempering the, the aggressiveness with the safety factor. So if you're going in for a gunshot on a maneuvering adversary, and it, 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 I just got to get, I just got to solve this last little angle. I got to put the paper right there, you know. And so, so you go inside the thousand foot bubble, and you can scare yourself by 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 having what we call fangs out. Your fangs are through the floor. Uh, you're so so uh, tunnel vision focused, like you're looking through a uh, like a sniper scope or a uh, a uh, a long range scope to you know shoot a shoot uh, some game or a bear or something. Uh, all everything else is just gone. That's all that you're focusing on, and then you have absolutely no per- perception of depths and distance. Um, because at, because inside a thousand feet, the uh, the target will balloon, if you will. It'll swell up so rapidly, it'll shock you first before uh, that your mind recognizes that I'm going to hit this guy. Wow. And so so that's why the thousand foot ball is there is to is to help you learn uh, to temper your aggressiveness in, tr- in trying to get this gun tracking kill uh, without endangering yourself or the person that you're fighting so it uh and that too like everything else we're talking about is a learned uh, trait if you will it's it's something that you learn with exposure um you know i and i've seen gun camera film uh, video gun camera video Uh, the young guys they're always taking taking shots you know 2,000, 2,500 feet, and the target's just a little bitty, 
It's about the size of a pipper. The pipper itself are a little bigger, a little larger. Uh, they got, as you get more and more confident that I can drive in there, you don't want to drive in there and sweeten the shot, uh, but you want to make sure you get the kill. So there's a trade off there. Um, and you have to recognize where's a thousand feet and when do I have to come off? Uh, unless you build that into your your whole uh, you know computations uh, as a warning flag, then then people will violate it regularly. Uh, so anyway, so I'm not sure I answered your question really, uh, but that is where the aggressiveness uh, will bite you. Is uh, uh, usually the near near, near misses, the, the close passes. Are as a result of lost SA, not aggressiveness, in my in my opinion. I mean, yeah. Now we're talking aggregates. You know, we're talking uh, percentage of what was the cause. Uh, you know, I've I, uh, I've lost friends in in mid airs before, and, and sometimes you shake your head. Like, How did that happen? Uh, usually, it happens with with uh, one of the two parties losing sight and hitting the other lose the side of the absolute, not because they're so aggressive that they drove in too close hmm. or or approached you know too close from the from the uh, the, the forward uh, aspect let's let's talk about that I mean that's the the sort of serious part of this conversation I suppose isn't it uh, you when we wrote our Eagle book together you dedicated it to two of your friends who had been killed at uh, Bitburg I think and um you know, you knew Mark Postar. Mark Postar was your best friend and best man at your wedding with Annie, and he was killed flying a MiG-23 out, out at Tonopah. Um, and you've just referenced some friends who were killed in mid-airs. Um, how do you handle the threat of death? Uh, not, I don't mean in combat. I mean, you know, you just take right. off one day for a training order and you don't come back it, again. And, yeah. and, and, and what do you, you know, what, what did you tell Annie about that and your children? Um how, how do you manage the expectations of you know the people that are behind you? You talked about your family in the last episode and the importance of of hitting your career objectives because that was their payback for all the things right. they did for you to support you. So I know they're important to you, but what's what's the you know the, what's the fighter pilot um, position on it, and what's the father and dad um, and husband position on it? Well, the first thing is the realization that on any given day. It could happen to me, and uh, not that that's something that's uh, you dwell on by any means, because uh, that, that that would be bad. Um, but on on any given day, there's just so many variables out there that, uh, and many of them, the only one that you really have any control over is the the stick and the throttles that are in your own hands. So, uh, and of course, the knowledge that you have in your head about what what you're doing and and how to do that uh, without endangering yourself. Uh, so, but it, but it's uh, it's very, very foolish, of course, to think it'll never happen to me. Uh, anyone who's, you know, I've got twelve hundred hours in the F fifteen. Anyone who's flown that much in area combat training, uh, uh, you you have close calls, and you know, but for a uh, you know a split second. Uh, yeah, you know, it could have been a, it could have been a, you know, a fireball with, with two, uh, two lives lost, but it wasn't. So, uh, so as far as, uh, preparing Annie for that, uh, if that, uh, you know, uh, eventuality, uh, occurred, I can't say that I was very good at it. I don't think any of us are, I, there's no way, uh, um, she knew Mark, uh, uh, like I did, we we'd gone to. Uh, he was at our wedding. We were we were at his wedding with Linda. Uh, uh, so and we'd gone, you know, double days together in Vegas and other places. So uh, so it's uh, yeah. She knew, um, you know, especially after he had, he'd gotten killed. She knew that it could happen. It could happen to me. Uh, uh, the, uh, the other aspect of that is that, uh, uh, for me personally, was that we have lost one pilot, one, uh, one, uh, instructor pilot during my four years at, uh, advanced as a T-38 IP. And I think I talked on previous, uh, 
segment, uh, there was a final turn accident. Student got got slow in the T38, and put it to a point where uh, there wasn't enough uh, wasn't enough thrust coming out of those engines to keep the airplane uh, from hitting the ground. Well, within three or four months of my arrival at Bitbird, we lost an F-15, and the guy got killed. Loyal to an intercept, intercept G-lock, G-loss of consciousness, um, and uh, hit the ground on, somewhere up in northern Germany, North German Plain, uh, in a low-fly area, doing doing a swirl with, uh, with I don't know, uh, German F-4Fs or uh, Phantom FGR-2s, out of Vilna Rath or somebody. No, and uh, and then we lost we lost another guy in a G lock. Uh, I even had a G lock. Uh, this is myself, um, and and woke up <laughs> because the, as as everything closed in on me, uh, I realized what was happening, and it, it, there was a low altitude uh, a slicing turn inter- intercept against I think some F fours from. Uh, Spain Olive or something. Uh, and my flight lead, I was behind. My flight lead had the radar contact. I didn't. He picked up the visual. I saw the belly of his airplane, and then the target was underneath him. So I rolled, put the lift vector out fire, and and and, and pulled my you know seven to nine G's, and uh, and with the nose slightly down, and I and I could see the grayness swooping in from all the sides. And I and I knew that if I didn't do something, this it was going to result in ground impact shortly. So I could it, I I'd even the, my vision had gone black. I just flicked the stick to the right to roll the airplane out, and and added just a little back pressure as an insurance policy to to get my nose above the horizon. And I woke up with my flight lead calling me on the radio, and I was passing through twelve thousand feet in wow. a climb. Wow. Uh, and I, I can remember waking up. I was looking down at the console. I can remember recognizing the INS. And I think that was on the right side. But anyway, so I could, I, and I thought to myself, well, when did they put an INS in a T 38? Because oh, I thought no I was, way. yeah, I thought I was flying a T 38. <laughs> what did they put? And oh, holy shit. You know, uh, so, uh, so I answered, uh, Log Randolph was my flight lead and answered answered because he was calling, calling, calling. Uh, and we had, uh, like I said, we just lost another guy in a G-Lock uh, accident, so we were really uh, sensitive to it. And uh, and Log, very experienced, previous F-4 guy, uh, and then Eagles and, um, and an instructor. And he said, well, let's, why don't we just uh, take it back to the bar? Uh, you know, we were nowhere close to bingo, but you know, I was done. Uh, and then we deep it and all that. Uh, so yeah, it could, it, it's one of those, we, once you learn, because there's two types of pilot pilots. When you're young and really aggressive and want to really show your stuff, how great you are, it's always, well, it'll never happen to me. Once you realize that yes, it, it very easily could happen to any one of us on any given day, no matter how good you are. And you and you and I know people personally uh people that you've met at fighter weapons school um or the 422 uh, yeah you know of people by name that are no longer with us and you and you shake your head well how could it happen to him well because any given day it can uh and it's not like you live with it as a fear you live with it uh knowing that it can happen so you don't dread it I guess, but anyway, like personalities and uh, psychiatries uh, differ with psychologies differ with each of us. Uh, but that's the way. I, I just knew that the only thing I could control was my two hands and piloting the airplane I was flying, and what I knew about uh, flying and flying well and flying safely. So that's probably the, really an ambiguous answer. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, provide you with any more it's your answer that's the answers i'm looking for yeah. so 